If you're a fan of using getting things done to stay on top of all the, well, things you need to get done, you'll love how to take smart notes for staying on top of all the things that you want to learn. I'll give you an introduction in my own words in this How to Take Smart Notes book summary. This is Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The note-taking system introduced in Sonke Ahrens' How to Take Smart Notes is a bit like getting things done for learning. GTD is great for things that have a clear objective, but creative insights can't be planned by definition. That's the point of an insight. It comes out of nowhere. One of my favorite quotes from the book, it is a huge misunderstanding that the only alternative to planning is aimless messing around. The challenge is to structure one's workflow in a way that insight and new ideas can become the driving forces that push us forward. In other words, you can't plan an insight, but you can structure the way you read and learn in a way that not only improves your retention, but that also leads you to new insights. The system introduced in How to Take Smart Notes is called a Zettelkasten, which is German for slip box. A slip box was originally a box full of slips of paper, each slip with a little note on it. The slips were arranged and annotated in a certain way to facilitate thinking and to link ideas. The most famous user of the Zettelkasten was a German sociologist named Nicholas Luhmann. Luhmann credited his slip box for his prolific career in which he published 58 books and hundreds of articles. His actual Zettelkasten is being studied in a long-term project at the University of Bielefeld in Germany. The linking, keyword, and organization characteristics of a slip box were a precursor to our modern-day internet. But now that we're no longer limited to slips of paper, writers and researchers are adapting the Zettelkasten technique to digital tools. There are four basic steps to follow to make smart notes for your own Zettelkasten, or slip box if you prefer. One, make fleeting notes. Two, make literature notes. Three, make permanent notes. Four, add permanent notes to the slip box. One, make fleeting notes. Always have a way to capture ideas that pop into your mind, or if reading, read actively, highlighting and taking notes. I personally carry around a tiny notebook and use the Drafts app on iOS to capture quick thoughts. I don't take notes while I read, but I do highlight on my Kindle. Two, make literature notes. Rewrite the important parts of what you've read, but do it in your own words. It sounds pointless, but it's surprisingly fun, and later on we'll get to how it helps you learn better. Three, make permanent notes. Break any literature notes or fleeting notes down into individual notes. Do this only for the most important ideas, the ones that are relevant to your interests and your ongoing projects. Do this a little bit each day so you don't get a huge backlog. Four, add permanent notes to the slip box. Lumen used a special branched numbering system to organize his notes. I prefer plain English note titles. You also want to add relevant tags to each note and link your note to related notes. The main reason to have a system like this is to direct your curiosity in a productive way and to turn your learning into writing. There are three things you'll do with your slip box. One, develop topics. Two, getting research and writing ideas. And three, turning your notes into writing. One, develop topics. As you make new notes, themes will start to develop around your areas of interest. You can interact with your notes to follow the links, and you'll see holes in your knowledge to guide your learning. Two, getting research and writing ideas. You'll never have to wonder again what you'd like to read about or write about. It will be clear from where there are lots of notes clustered around a topic in your slip box. For example, you may have many notes with a certain tag, or if you use a piece of software such as Obsidian, you can visualize which notes link to one another to see patterns in your thinking. 
Three, turn your notes into writing. You can collect your notes together and quickly form rough drafts for articles or books. Don't simply copy your notes, though. Rewrite them, stitching them together along the way to create a completed piece. How to Write Smart Notes is primarily directed at academic writers, and as Aaron's points out, most books on academic writing see writing papers as a linear task with a beginning and an end. I talk about the four stages of creativity in my book, Mind Management, Not Time Management. Taking smart notes allows you to do preparation on creative problems through small habits. By the time you write your first draft, after incubation, illumination is easy. Most of the work is already done. Sounds exciting, right? But when you try to create your own slip box, the possibilities can be overwhelming. Here are some do's and don'ts that can help guide your thinking. Do choose keywords sparingly. When choosing keywords for your notes, your first instinct might be to make sure you tag your note with every relevant keyword you can think of. But if you use too many keywords, it becomes hard to manage your slip box. Aaron's warns not to choose the keyword that is the most appropriate to the content. Instead, think about in what context you might want to retrieve that note and choose your keywords in a way that would help you find that note. I'll give an example in the next related tip, which is don't use generic keywords. Another instinct you might have is to choose generic keywords like if the note is related to psychology, you might think that you should tag it with psychology. But remember that the purpose of the slip box is to facilitate insights. A tag such as psychology is way too broad. Choose your keywords sparingly, as I said in the previous tip, but also choose your keywords according to your specific areas of interest or lines of thought. Like imagine you're really interested in studying storytelling. You have a note about Eve eating an apple in the Garden of Eden. Your instincts might tell you to tag the note with apple or fruits. Instead, you might have a tag called symbols of discord or even apples of discord. You can create a whole collection of notes showing apples as symbols of discord in stories such as in The Judgment of Paris or Snow White. Do link every note to other notes. Each time you create a new permanent note that goes into the slip box, you should link it to at least one other note. Each note should serve as a starting point to follow a line of thought, and links help you navigate through your notes to see what ideas spring up. Links may point directly to another note. That note might be on a different topic. For instance, your note about Snow White's stepmother feeding her a poisoned apple tagged with symbols of discord might link to another note about Snow White's stepmother looking in her mirror on a daily basis, and that note might be tagged vanity, a topic under which you have other stories with vanity as a theme. Besides linking to other notes, notes can also be linked to a topic overview. This could present a summary of your notes on a topic. In other words, one of your keywords or tags. The summary could link to other notes on that topic with a short description of what you'll find in each note. For example, your vanity overview note might link not only to the story of Snow White's stepmother looking in her mirror on a daily basis, it might also link to the story of Narcissus being captivated by his own reflection in the river. These summaries are great starting points for developing into finished articles. Finally, don't copy and paste. When you're creating a slip box with digital tools, another instinct you'll have is to copy and paste notes directly from your source material. The thinking is it's the most efficient way. Well, the purpose of your slip box is not to be the most efficient directory of information. Just as important as providing a reference to things you learned in the past is the actual learning of those things. You learn better when you translate what you've read into your own words. Resist the temptation to copy and paste directly from your source. I personally may copy and paste to keep a direct quote from source material, but I will always supplement it with an in-my-own-words explanation of what's being said. This brings us to the science behind why the slip box is effective for learning. Aarons explains that studies show success doesn't come from willpower. Instead, it comes 
from creating a working environment that makes willpower unnecessary. There are five ways working with a slip box shapes your habits so you learn better. One, elaboration. Two, spacing. Three, variation. Four, contextual interference. And five, deliberate effort. One, elaboration. This is why it's important not to copy-paste, but to write things in your own words. When you write something in your own words, you have to connect the new knowledge to your existing knowledge. You have to think about its broader implications. Aarons says elaboration is the most effective technique for learning. Spacing. In managing a slip box, you retrieve information repeatedly after time away from it. This happens when you review your highlights and fleeting notes to elaborate on them and turn them into permanent notes. This also happens when you retrieve old notes to connect them to new notes. Your memory of information fades away over time, but when you're repeatedly exposed to information, a phenomenon called space repetition, you retain it better. Three, variation. Using a slip box, you review information in a variety of contexts. You read it. You take fleeting notes. You translate those into permanent notes. Then you review the information further when retrieving it and linking it to other notes. This variety helps you more robustly link new knowledge to existing knowledge. Four, contextual interference. Contextual interference is a randomization of contexts, and it has been shown to improve learning. For example, instead of practicing throwing all day, you might randomly alternate amongst throwing, catching, and running. The very nature of managing a slip box randomizes the contexts in which you interact with information. Five, deliberate effort. Deliberate practice, where you're deliberately practicing individual skills with rapid feedback, is more effective than simply doing whatever you feel like. Managing a slip box is structured and deliberate practice. I hope you found this summary helpful. As an author, I was excited to first learn of the Zettelkasten or slip box technique, but I wound up spending many hours watching really confusing explanations on YouTube or reading equally confusing articles. How to Take Smart Notes was the only resource that gave me a good first principles overview of how a slip box works. From that, I've been able to adapt the technique to my own workflow as a blogger, podcaster, and author. I do hope to share my own note-taking system soon, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it. Until then, I highly recommend you pick up How to Take Smart Notes. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Thank you this week to Omniscient Digital for having me on their podcast, The Long Game. One thing I've learned in over a decade as an independent creator is to invest in ideas. They really are everything. Most of them don't work out, but the ones that do can be big. I had one idea that led to a book deal and transformed my life. I had another idea that connected me with a company that later sold to Google, which brought a surprise payday. Big ideas start small, and the place I share my ideas first is my weekly newsletter. It's called Love Mondays, and each week I share a big little idea about how to break through to become a true original and make it as a creator. I also share my favorite quotes and books and tools for thought. Think of Love Mondays as like a shot of creative fuel to start off your week. There's several thousand subscribers. We're having a good time. Join Love Mondays at kdv.co slash newsletter. That's kdv.co slash newsletter. You might have noticed I don't have ads on Love Your Work. I haven't had them for a long time now. In fact, a big company whose name you would definitely recognize offered me money to advertise in this show recently, and I had to turn it down. Why? Because some money feels good, some money feels not as good. When I see that somebody bought one of my books, that feels good. When a company advertises on the show, I mean, it's money, but that doesn't feel quite as good. Another kind of money that feels really good is the money I get from my Patreon supporters. It feels like an honest exchange. It's a vote of confidence that they like the show. Since I myself support a number of creators on Patreon, I know it feels good to vote with my dollars and support the kind of work I would like to see in the world. And that's what I'm trying to do here make the kind of podcast I want to listen to and share the ideas I want to see in the world. So if you like the show, a great way to let me know is to support the show on Patreon. Even a few bucks a month helps. It really adds up over all the dedicated listeners 
and it motivates me to keep doing what I'm doing. If you'd like to support the show, visit the Patreon page at patreon.com slash Cadavy. You'll see the different levels and perks available. Even if you're on the fence, check out the page. Again, it's at patreon.com slash Cadavy. That's patreon.com slash Cadavy. Thanks for your support. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by our top Patreon supporters, including Jeffrey Mason and our mini sponsor, Auto Spotting at autospotting.io. The theme music for Love Your Work is At Sea by Dorena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Cadaby, Inc. <laughs>